And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our keynote speaker, historian and Pulitzer Prize winning author, John Meacham. Thank you. Everything was falling apart. In the first years of the 1860s, the nation was torn as under amid what the beleaguered wartime president would call the fiery trial of the Civil War. The conflict was existential, claiming perhaps three quarters of a million lives. No one knew what would happen. No one knew if the nation conceived in two Philadelphia summers, one in 1776, the other in 1787, would survive as Union and Confederate forces clashed again and again and again, once war came in the spring of 1861. And yet in the darkness of war, there were glimmers of light. In the summer of 1862, Enveloped by the demands of defending the nation from armed rebellion, President Abraham Lincoln signed legislation authorizing the Transcontinental Railroad, a far-sighted act for a commander-in-chief buffeted by the winds of war. Hope in a time of fear, optimism in a moment of pessimism, a thought of the future amid the storms of the present. The Transcontinental Railroad stands even now as an emblem of American boldness and of American Union. The Golden Spike was about many things, not least commerce and technology. And it was, truth be told, about some of the worst aspects of the American soul, particularly in light of the tragic treatment of Native Americans. But it was also about the best parts of that soul, those precincts of our national character that look ahead, that reach out, that dream big. We should not sentimentalize the American experience. The nation has been morally flawed, often egregiously so, from the beginning. We must be honest about that, honest about the plights of African Americans, of Native Americans, of women who have not yet voted for a century in this country, of immigrants. And our honesty should lead us to do all that we can to be about the work of justice. Talked about for three decades before the legislation, the fact of the Transcontinental Railroad, the fact that the Transcontinental Railroad was authorized during the Civil War and was completed in 1869 amid Reconstruction, makes the whole thing unmistakably American. For to build in a time of destruction, and to persevere in a time of division was very much in keeping with the spirit of a nation that had always believed, as Thomas Paine had put it, that we had it in our power to begin the world over again. And as Winston Churchill once remarked, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing once we've exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> we've proven the old boy right again and again. A continent that would come together what Jefferson called the empire of liberty, would not be just parts, but a whole. The nation was united here in this place, if not in spirit, in fact. And facts, as John Adams would remind us, are stubborn things. We stand, therefore, on a kind of sacred ground. The story of the Transcontinental Railroad is the story of America, for better and for worse. For both are stories of ambition and of drive, of vision and of unity, of hope and of history. And it's especially significant that we're here at this particular moment in the life of the nation. For many of the elements so essential to the conception and to the realization of this vast project seem all too elusive in our own time. A century and a half on from the foresight and the energy of a Lincoln and his battles to preserve the Union and to lay the tracks, if you will, for its future prosperity, we, you and I, 
are caught in a moment of public dispiritedness, of reflexive partisanship, and of a broad distrust of the future. That's not a partisan point. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I live in Tennessee, so when I say I have conservative friends, I'm being redundant. <laughs> but that's why this is a good moment and a good place to reflect on who we've been and who we are and where we might go in the next 150 years. To know what's come before is to be armed against despair. Think about it just for a second. If the men and women of the past, with all of their flaws and limitations and ambitions and appetites, could press on through ignorance and superstition, through racism and sexism, through selfishness and greed, to form a more perfect union, then perhaps we too can right wrongs and leave things better than we found them. Our common welfare depends not on what separates us, despite what you see on the internet and on cable news, but on what unifies us. St. Augustine defined a nation as a multitude of rational beings united by the common objects of their love. That's a grand sentiment for a beautiful day like this, but I'm gonna repeat it because it's the best definition of a nation I've ever encountered. A multitude of rational beings united by the common objects of their love. So nearly two decades into this new century, what do we love in common? The painful answer is we don't love enough in common. Still, I'd argue that history has the capacity to bring us together. For our story, for all of its faults, is ultimately the story of obstacles overcome, of crises resolved, of freedom expanded. We have always grown in strength the more widely we have opened our arms and the more we have opened our hearts. From Lexington and Concord to Lewis and Clark, from Fort Sumter to D-Day, from Seneca Falls to Selma, and yes, from the canals of the East to the railroads of the West, Americans have sought to perfect our union. So what can we in our time learn from the past? That the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. That compromise is the oxygen of democracy. And that we learn the most from those who came before, not by looking up at them adoringly or down on them condescendingly, but by looking them in the eye and taking their measure as human beings not as impossibly perfect heroes or hopelessly irredeemable villains. Knowing the history of freedom is not only illuminating, but enabling. A person who understands the past and all its glory and grandeur and horror and injustice understands that, as Churchill once put it, the path of civilization, while never straight, is essentially upward, upward to what he called the broad sunlit uplands of happiness and peace. We stand now in the sunlight, the beautiful sunlight, of a legacy of union for the architects and the builders and the lawmakers and the laborers who transformed a dream into a reality in this place 150 years ago, knew that a nation connected might just be a nation unified. It was made possible by the powerful in government and in commerce and by the powerless, the immigrant laborers from China, from Ireland and elsewhere, who joined in the hard, unforgiving work of construction. And it was, we should note, constructed in an era of prevailing white supremacy and an ongoing struggle to more broadly and justly apply the implications of what may well have been the most important sentence ever rendered originally in English. Jefferson's assertion that President Nelson mentioned that all men are created equal. Now, I will say quickly, I am always careful when I make hyperbolic claims that something is the most important ever rendered in English, not least because of the old story about the Texas school board candidate who was against teaching Spanish in public schools and said on the stump one day, 
if English is good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. So, uh, I'm from Tennessee, so I do all I can to make Texas remember that they would still be part of Spain if it weren't for us. <laughs> Easy, yeah, there's a Texan here. You get your papers stamped on your way? Uh, I made that joke to George W. Bush when he was governor of Texas, and I said, you know, sir, if it weren't for me, you know, you'd be governor of a province in Spain. He went, that's pretty funny, jerk. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry. Um, we stand here today knowing that the work of America is not done, that in many ways the American Revolution unfolds still. That's our blessing and our burden. If a nation fighting for its survival in the crucible of the 19th century could transcend the tumult of the moment to do something this big and this hopeful, then why can't we? The Transcontinental Project was shaped by sectionalism, by battles for power, by party politics, by slavery and freedom, and yet our forebears delivered. However bad things are right now, and that, like so much else in America, today and always, is a matter of opinion. I, for one, would rather be dealing with Facebook than Fort Sumter, wouldn't you? Let's not indulge ourselves in the narcissism of the present and act as though our problems are more insuperable than anything that ever confronted any previous generation. The problems that were overcome to create a nation where, for all our ferocity, what George Washington called the sacred fire of liberty still burns here. And for all of our unhappiness, what is our immigration issue in this country? Our immigration issue is that people want to come here. As Ronald Reagan said, they are all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward home. If Americans want to know what is possible, come here. If they want to know what can happen when government and the private sector cooperate rather than clash, come here. If they want to know how to build a nation worth fighting for, come here. And if they want to know why a spirit of union matters, come here. And if they want to understand how the faith of Jefferson and Lincoln and TR and FDR and John Kennedy and Ronald Reagan, a faith founded on the conviction that tomorrow can be better than today, and how that faith can find tangible expression, come here. The story is not perfect, but then neither are we. History tells us that we rise when we build and we thrive, when we give everyone what Lincoln called a fair chance. A fair chance. Such was the animating impulse behind the golden spike, and big ideas and big dreams are the stuff of the best of American history. And in that history lies our hope. Thank you.